Yeah, it means church. And so in uh, Hebrew, the definition um, is a calling out. Not Hebrew, I'm sorry. In Greek, it means a calling out, um, a popular meeting, especially a religious congregation, assembly, or church. That's what the word ecclesia, that's the Greek word ecclesia. And so when Jesus, and maybe I should start there, in Matthew chapter 16, maybe I should start there. Let's go to Matthew chapter 16. I'm just flowing with the Holy Spirit. You're going to get good at this. <laughs> I got a quite a few scriptures today too, so you're going to get good. And I'm going to go quickly. So Matthew chapter 16, verse... Let me see. Uh, starting at verse 13. Um, and I'm going to read 13 through 19. 13 through 19. So it says, Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. And remember last week or a couple weeks ago, I can't remember, we used this scripture, I referenced this scripture, and it says Peter, meaning rock, right? And he says, uh, little rock, Petrus, right? Little rock. Um, and then he says, on this rock, big rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Oh, you can stop there, verse 18. And so that word church there, when Jesus says, I'm building my church, that is the word ecclesia. And so that when Jesus said that word church, it was not a new term. It, wasn't the, it, it was something that the people of that time were familiar with, that word ecclesia. It was not a religious word. Um, and... It's uh, even the Hebrew culture, they understood, if we could understand um, the idea of uh, the council that they had at the, the Sanhedrin council um, uh, was a, it was a governmental, a religious body, a governmental body that would make decisions for the people. And so this is kind of the idea, but um, during the Greek period of time, during Greek culture, um, there was a dimension of the word ecclesia, or that was, is where that word ecclesia really came from. Uh, it didn't really come from the Hebrew culture. It came from the Greek culture. It was really more of a symbol of really a more modern um, evolution of time. Right. So if we can think about Jesus came at this perfect time in history where we can see that there was a modern, uh, more uh, modern um, resources that were uh, beginning to become more available. So what, what do I mean by that? Like um, we can see how um, there was irrigation systems that were being built. There were roads, like we say, the Roman road, right? Because Rome, at the time when Rome began to imperialize, when we say imperialization, what that means is that there was an emperor, right? So there was an emperor who governed over various different parts of the world, almost like England did with colonization. I might have to have Kahari come up here and explain everything for me, uh, the, the history teacher. <laughs> so. You know, like what England did with colonization, right? You know how England colonized the Americas and they colonized South Africa and they colonized. So they had a central location, but they sent people, right, 
to these various different places to establish their rule and establish their government. And so that's really what imperialization was. It was like an emperor who would have certain territories that they governed. But the Greeks had already adopted this idea of ecclesia. And what ecclesia was, um, they had instituted it. And um, what it was, was it consisted of men who were 18 years of age or older. And uh, they had to serve at least two years in the military. And um, why, why was this important? Because um, you know, m many countries even do that today, right? Where they have political leaders that come out of the military. Why? Because the military, serving in the military shows a sense of loyalty, so it shows a sense of bravery, right? It shows a sense of dedication to your country, right? And so that's, so this is part of it. They, it's, it's, when they served two years in the military, they were able to be a part of this ecclesia. What was this ecclesia? It was a, um, it was a place where they could govern in smaller cities, right? So just like in the United States, we have now, because we have larger cities, we do the same thing, right? So you have the president, you have the, the Congress, you have the U.S. Senate, right? And then we have governors that govern over states, and then we have, you know, a Congress within the states, and then we have cities that have mayors and city councils, right? And so if we can think of it that way, and even within a city, you have city councils, but even within a city, you have other groups, right? You have like business alliances, you have the chamber of commerce, right? We have a chamber of commerce, we have all these various different groups that help govern a certain city or a, a territory or an area, right? We have county, we have a county board, right? And so they were the first ones in this modern era right, or this, this time to, to, to begin to govern in this way, and they began to, they start saying that, okay, we can go into these very small city states, we can go into these small areas, and we can take a team of leaders, we can send out a team of leaders who are two years in the military, who uh, are 18 years of older, who have the interests of the state, who have the interests of our government, and they're going to go into this little town and they're going to rule and govern in this little town, right? That, that was the term, that's where the term ecclesia came from. I just want to paint that picture so we know when Jesus said ecclesia, he said, I'm going to build one of those, right? And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so there are many, um, so in a broader sense, ecclesia came to mean a group of citizens who were separated to duly convene. Uh, they were to convene to discuss matters related to the well-being of their society. Why is that important? I'm saying that because we, the church, is the ecclesia. We are the ecclesia, right? But most people don't have that picture when it comes to the church. Most people have a picture of not us as a governmental body in the earth, because Jesus says, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church, will not prevail against my governmental body. What we have a picture of is a building where somebody comes up and sings a song, and then, you know, I feel good about myself, and then I go home, right? We don't have a picture that we're all called to be uh, officials within this governmental body. We're not just a, a people within a building, but we are a people who convene for the purpose of kingdom business. We are the people who convene for the purpose of doing kingdom business, not within the church, but for people who convene for the purpose of doing kingdom business throughout the world, right? So our strategy is to come together to figure out, our strategy is to come together and find out, well, why is there so much drug use in this city? We convene and we come together to govern over that and say, hey, the gates of hell will not prevail against our government. Amen? 
The, the, the gates of hell will not prevail. And so we come to convene and say, hey, how come there's so much homosexuality going on? Let's convene and figure out what is the strategy, what is the process to go and deal with that? This is why we come to convene. It's not, you know, most of us, we just come to convene and say, oh, Lord, I had a bad day. Help me, please. Then we say it's a hospital. It is a hospital, but, I mean, that's not the main purpose of the church. And I'll give you an example of how this was already happening throughout that time where the church was beginning to exist. There was already this whole idea of the ecclesia, even in other areas of society. So in Acts chapter 19, so Acts chapter 19 and verse 23, starting in verse 23. And I'm 23 through 27, I'm going to start there. It says, about that time there arose no little disturbances concerning the way. What is the way? The way of Jesus Christ. There was uh, no little disturbance, meaning that people was having a problem with this message. And I'm saying this because this is, this should be really an expectation that there's going to be resistance to the church. Because this is common that when Paul, when the apostles began to preach, there was great resistance. And, and many of us in the church today, we're afraid to preach against resistance, right? I mean, we're afraid to really just challenge um, the status quo, right? This is, this is uh, uh, Pride Month, right? I don't, I don't know why this keep coming up, right? The LGBT community, right, is Pride Month, right? But no, like most of us, we don't, we don't, want, we don't want to challenge that. Right. We don't want to we don't want to say anything against that. Right. Because it's this too much resistance. The whole it seems like the whole world is against us. Right. And, and so this is what it says. There was no little disturbance concerning the way, meaning that they were they were not happy with what Paul was preaching. It says for a man, na- a man named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis or I think in the King James it says Diana, uh, brought no little business to the craftsmen. These have gathered together, these he gathered together with the workmen in similar trades and said, men, you know that from this business we have our wealth. And so in other words, they were making these idols to this goddess and they were making, because this was the, this was what was acceptable in that place at that time in Ephesus, right? This is what everybody was doing, right? And so Paul began to preach and say, hey, that's wrong. <laughs> that's going to send you to hell. You know, worshiping Diana is going to send you to hell. And, they, and, and people were getting saved. And so the, the silversmith, they realized that they were losing their money. So what did they do? They gathered their ecclesia together. They gathered their, their council together. And so it says, the men that, uh, uh, men you know that from this business we have our wealth, and you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. And there is danger, not only that this trade of ours may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may even be disposed from her magnificent magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. And so in verse 28 it says, when they heard this, they were enraged and were crying out, Great as Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with the confusion, and they rushed together into the theater, dragging with them Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, uh, Macedonians, who were Paul's companions in travel. But when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him would not let him. And even some of the uh, Asia arcs who were friends of his sent to him 
and were, ur and were urging him not to venture into the theater. Now some cried out one thing, uh, some another, for the assembly was in confusion. So this is the point I'm making. So that word assembly there, in the Greek, that word assembly is the same word, ekklesia. And so, again, this is my, my pointing out that ekklesia was already in existence. It was an assembly. Why did they gather? So that they could figure out what they was going to do about Paul, right? They came to govern in Ephesus to say, hey, we need to come together. We need to bring the assembly together so we can figure out what we're going to do about Paul. And he's getting all these people saved, right? And so some of the crowd prompted Alexander, whom the Jews had put forward, and Alexander, motioning his hand, wanted to make a defense to the crowd. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, for about two hours, they, were, um, they all cried out with one voice, greatest Artemis of the Ephesians. And so they were afraid that because he was a Jew, that maybe he was going to say something in opposition, right? And then verse 35, it says, in verse 35, it says, and when the town clerk, so again, there's a town clerk, right? So we can see there was a structure. There was a governmental structure. The town clerk got involved in everything, right? So that we can figure out, okay, what is going to be the decision that's going to be made about what we're going to do about Paul, right? It says, and when the town clerk quieted to the people, he said, men of Ephesus, who, who is there who does not know that the city of Ephesians is a temple keeper of the great Artemis and the sacred stone that fell from the sky? Seeing then that these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing rash. For you have brought these men here who are neither sacrilegious or blasphemers of our goddess. If therefore Demetrius and the craftsmen with him have a complaint against anyone, the courts are open. And so again, it's saying, okay, the courts are open. What did they do? They just got, gathered all the people together and they said, hey, we're going to have court. And so why am I saying that? Because, um, and then it says in verse 39, it says, but if you see anything further, it shall be settled in the regular assembly. Again, that word assembly there is ecclesia. Um, so I just wanted to point out that this was a modern way of functioning at that time. They would bring people together, and when they used the word assembly, or they used the, the word assembly meant ecclesia, and, and when we use the word today, it's church, assembly, ecclesia, church, it all has the same meaning to it. It was a governing body to govern the, 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 the things of the day. And so Jesus intended for the church to govern in the world as a unit. And so this is really what Jesus is saying. He's saying, hey, I'm building my church so that we can govern in the world as one body. And we have to understand that the structure of the church is built to fulfill that purpose. This is why the church is built for that very specific purpose. And we will be accountable. You have to understand that not only are you accountable for your own personal, your own personal life of righteousness, your own personal life of living without sin, your own personal uh, responsibility to live according to the life of Jesus Christ, but you're also accountable to how you connect in the body of Christ. Amen? This is what Jesus, Jesus died for the church. He died for all people, but he says he's building his church, right? He's coming back, not just for individual people only, but he's coming back for his church. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Jesus, the kingdom, this is why we talk about the kingdom of God. It's a kingdom. Remember, they asked Jesus, when are you going to restore the kingdom? And this is really what Jesus said. Okay, well, this is how it's going to happen. I'm building my church. And this is how the church functions. Just like, and what's uniquely different about, and so I'll use the Catholic church as an example, right? The Catholic church has a pope, right? 
And so they have an idea of governing in the earth. And so from the Catholic Church's perspective is that they, they have a pope and they believe that when Jesus Christ returns, he's going to sit at the seat of the pope and then he's going to govern through the Catholic Church. And so you can see that the Catholic Church has a very organized structure, right? And they are spread out throughout the entire world and they have a very... Um, they have a very uh, uh, disciplined and very uh, organizational structure to it where um, it's very top down, right? Um, but when Jesus said the church, he used the word ecclesia, and this is the reason why I use these examples, is because an ecclesia is more like little, small, little fragments of government that, that, gov that is self-governing within various different communities, right? It's not top down. It's very, it's more like this, right? It's more spread out like this with all of us, all the people who are a part of it are, are governing officials in some way or another, right? Amen. And so this is important for us to understand that and that the, for us to know how we fit into that. And so here's a process, Ephesians 2, I'm gonna repeat this again, I read this, uh, uh, a couple weeks. So some of this stuff is repetitious because this is how we learn. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, starting to verse 15. Uh, 15 and 16, it says, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. Uh, so again, ordinances are like uh, laws or government, you know, like we have a constitution and that sort of thing, right? Uh, it says that he might create in himself a new man in place of the two. He's talking about Jews and Gentiles. He's talking about coming into one government, one body, one way of doing things, right? So making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And then skipping now to verse 19, uh, it says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And so, again, you are a citizen. You're not just, we have, to, we have to shift from this mindset of saying, hey, I'm just a born again believer and I'm a citizen of heaven, right? And I'm going to heaven one day, but it's more than you just being a citizen of heaven. You're a citizen of of the church in the earth. You're a citizen of the body of Christ in the earth, amen? And he says, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being a cornerstone in which the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple unto the Lord in whom you also are built, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So what am I saying? I'm saying that, you know, again, the, the foundation, Jesus Christ being the cornerstone, is the foundation of apostles and prophets. There is a particular way that God is building his church, that Jesus is building his church. There's a way that he's building his church, and there's a purpose for his church. Amen. Amen. It's not just random. It's not just a place for us. to. It's not only about us coming together for fellowship. It's not only about us coming together to hear the word. It's not only about us coming together so that we can personally grow spiritually. It's not only about those things. He's, there's a very specific purpose and there's a very specific way that he's building his church. And we have to be uh, mindful of that. And we have to um, align with that if we want to uh, to be effective the way that God wants us to be effective. So in order for us to continue to grow, everyone has to do their part. And so as apostles are being commissioned to go and lay foundation in various places, various aspects of ministry, various places or aspects of ministry, that's what an apostle is, is being a sent one, or so sent, being sent could mean, you know, being sent to do something in one place for 20 years, but you're still sent, right? Uh, being sent could be uh, being sent to establish, uh, because, it, because land foundation can take a long time. It could take, a, 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 it could be sent to do 
a, a multi-dimensional thing that requires uh, other pieces to it, so it, it takes some time to do. You know, there's times where Paul were, was in one area for two years, is preaching in one area for two years consistently, and then he went to another year, uh, place and preached for like seven years. And so there is this, this place of consistency. There's a place of plowing. There's this place of, uh, you hear me repeating myself, right? Uh, this is how we learn, right? It's because through repetition, through plowing, through, through making sure you get it. Amen? That's what, that's what apostles do, is just lay foundation, lay foundation. Make sure that you got a proper foundation so that you can grow. Amen? If you don't have your ABCs, you, you're not going to be able to write a book, right? If you don't know your, you know, your numbers, if you don't know your addition, you're, you're not going to be able to put it together uh, an algorithm, you know, a financial database, right? Because you don't know your, you know, you don't know how to add and subtract. Amen. You, you have to, you know, we have to go line upon line. It has to be a process and foundation is, is key. Uh, so as apostles are being commissioned to go and lay foundation in various places and various aspects of ministry, then there's elders that come to water the seed that apostles plant. And they continue to cultivate the soil so the hearts of men can be ready to receive more of the word of God. And so what is an elder? An elder is a spiritually mature believer. That's what an elder is. When someone operates in the office, so we say the office of someone aspires the office of a bishop, they're talking about that word bishop, that word elder, that word pastor is all interchangeable. And so I know the church today has really kind of made that confusing, but really the word bishop, elder, and pastor, and teacher really can all be interchangeable words. So this is the reason why in some churches they just use the word elder. But when you're in the office, that word office, what does that word office mean? It means to do a work or in its official capacity, right? Or uh, where there is a dedicated responsibility for you to do the work of a mature believer. That's when it says, so if you desire the office of a bishop or if you desire the office of an elder, that, that means that you are in a place of, of working as a mature believer in its official capacity. That's what the word office really means, right? And so what does that mean? How, does that, uh, how, how is that responsibility? Elders are supposed to continue to water. So when the apostle comes to lay foundation, like what Paul was doing, he came to a certain city, preached for two years, laid foundation, and there was resistance, right? They tried a couple times, they tried to kill him, they stoned him, tried to drag him out the city, right? Uh, um, they wanted to try to kill him, even in this instance here that I just read, right? They, they congregated together because uh, he was, you know, getting people saved. The Bible says it was like uh, several thousand people, 5,000 people or something like that that got saved. So you can imagine the silversmith, they were really upset because they're losing their money, right? They're ready to stone Paul. And so they wanted to drive him out of the city. And so, so what needs to happen after Paul came to lay the foundation and those people get saved, um, and he began to start teaching a certain principle, those folks got saved, somebody needs to continue to water. Somebody needs to continue to cultivate. Someone needs to continue to bring nourishment, right? And that's why they set elders in the church or pastors uh, so that you can continue to cultivate what's already, the foundation that's already been laid. Amen? Acts chapter 4, uh, verse 1. It says, uh, as, And as they were speaking to the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So remember, the Sadducees, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. So they were annoyed that he was teaching about resurrection from the dead. And they arrested them and put them in custody into the next day. For it was already evening, but uh, many of those who had heard the word believed. Yeah, and then it says, and the number of the men that came about were 5,000. 
So Paul had preached, 5,000 folks got saved. They were upset, right? And so they gathered together their ecclesia, their assembly, to make a decision what they were going to do about Paul. Amen? Um, and so, why am I saying that? I'm saying that Uh, I'm sorry, this was uh, Peter. I'm sorry that they were coming against Peter at this time. Um, they asked, so they challenged him. I'm just going to paraphrase. It said in verse 4, I mean, verse uh, 5 through 12, it says, they asked him, you know, by what authority did you come here to start preaching like this? And um, Peter it says, Peter, then filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if you were being examined today concerning a good deed done to a crippled man, by what means this man has been healed, let it be known to all that you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by him, this man is standing before you well. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. And so I thought this was key. It says, so he's talking to this council, right? He's talking to this council of leaders, elders, of people. He calls them builders. He says, you know, so when we think of the term ecclesia or council, right? Their purpose was to build. And he says, he says, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. He says, this was the chief cornerstone. In other words, what is he saying? He's saying that you're building, but you're building the wrong way. You're building something, you, and we can see this today, right? This is the challenge. Why am I saying this? Because we see churches right, still today that are building, but they're building the wrong way. You can build and you can have all kinds of people, you can have council, you can have an ecclesia, you can have a governing body, but if you are not governing from the right perspective with the right cornerstone, with the right source, right? Because what does Jesus say? He says, I'm building, what does Jesus say? He says, I'm building my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So what does that mean? That means that, so from my perspective, what does that mean? I'm just, I'm going to summarize. I know I see some of y'all glazing over, but th that's okay. I'm, I'm, there's seed going in. There's seed going in. There's, what am I saying? Why am I saying all this? Because the, the, the importance of, of understanding the difference from just a church and Jesus' church is Jesus says that he wants us to govern. He says the gates of hell won't prevail against it. So what does that mean? He, he wants us to build from a place where, where he says, in that same passage of scripture, he says, and I'll give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, right? And whatsoever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. And so what is he saying? I want you to operate from two dimensions. I want you to operate from a place of governing of, with the natural things and the natural things that you see in the earth, but you also govern from a place of, uh, from a spiritual place. Because what happens, the natural the reason why we have a problem with LGBT community is because there's fallen angels that come to blind the minds of people, right? The reason why we have problems with drug addictions and, and people saying to themselves, I just had a conversation with someone the other day who said that um, they thought that they feel like it is a um, condition, is the word she used when she wants to be called he or she, right? That she used, she said, well, it's a condition. And psychologists say that this is the way I deal with this condition. I just need to identify as uh, he. Or, you know, this is how I, and I, and I asked, I said, well, do you, do you understand the spiritual dimension of things? And so, like, there's a psychological, um, scientific uh, reasoning and maybe 
uh, people may find that there's a scientific solution, right? And that is something that you could say, okay, well, because it came from Dr. So-and-so, and because they have a PhD and they've studied this for so long, then we could say this is a trusted, reliable source, right? But do we do the same thing about spiritual stuff? And so, when I, and so I say, is there a trusted, reliable spiritual source? She says, well, yeah, I believe that spirit. She says, I believe spiritually because I feel a certain way, that's the spiritual part of it. I like, know, you know, spirit, spiritually, there's scientific too. There's science to God spoke, and it was, right? There's science to how this earth came to be. There's, you can't create, you know, order out of chaos. It's just logically, even from a scientific perspective, that makes no sense. How do you take chaos and then make order out of chaos, right? So anyway, what, what am I saying? I'm saying that when we see people are, what is that called anyway? Um, binary or what do you call it? Um, um, identification of um, gender neutral, right? Is that what it's called? I think nobody knows. <laughs> you know, when people say that, well, I identify, I identify as a female when they're a male, right? Or identify as a, this, all this crazy stuff, right? Just the world has gone crazy, right? But people, my point is, when I was talking to her, she genu genuinely felt this. It's right, right? She genuinely, and it, even as I'm talking, right, I could see that. I said, do you understand what I'm saying? And her eyes, she's just like, Nope, <laughs> right? And then I could tell that there was a moment where I could see like the light bulb went off. You could see, you know, I could watch you guys, right? And tell, you know, when the light bulb goes off, when you're like, oh yeah, you could tell something shifted, right? But she still didn't wanna, she didn't wanna feed into that. Why? Because there's demons that are working on the inside that's preventing her from being free. Right? And what does Jesus say? He says, know the truth or get an understanding, get revelation of the truth, right? Not only just hear it with your ears, right? So this is the work of apostles, right? Not just to release revelation, right? So you don't just hear it with your ears, but you understand it in your heart. Because when you understand, he didn't say just hear the truth and it'll make you free. He said, know the truth and it will make you free. Because there, there, you can't just hear it, you gotta know it, right? Because when you know it, then there's a level of faith that, that switches off, the, the turns on the, on the light bulb, right? And then it, it, it releases you from the demonic oppression. Then you're not deceived anymore, right? And so demons want to come to bring deception to people. This is the reason why when we're ministering to people, you know, they can't receive because they, there is demonic in, interference, right? And so what is the church, how does the church govern? The church is whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. What, these are the keys to the kingdom of God being released in the earth is to not only govern from a natural place of just gathering together, but we also govern from a spiritual place. We also deal with the fallen angels. We also deal with the principalities. We also deal with the demons that are in people. This is who we are as a governing body, as an ecclesia. We work together. How does that work in a practical way? If I minister and deliver to someone, then the elders come and support that ministry, right? If I'm, if I'm ministering deliverance and casting out a demon from someone, everybody prays together. We all pray. We don't just sit and watch me. We don't just sit and say, oh, look at the spectacle that's going on. We don't just sit and say, we all align our faith, right? Because we are a team. We are an ecclesia. We are a governmental body. Amen? I mean, this is why this is, why this is important for us to understand and know that we're not just spectators in the church, right? Because we all, you know, supply one to another. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. It's the reason why everybody, and this is what I said earlier, I believe everybody's supposed to prosper. I mean, meaning that you should understand that God's going to take care of you. You ain't going to be in debt. You're not going to be homeless. You're not, amen? 
Amen. This is a, the Bible says that the poor will always be with us, but he wasn't talking about you. Amen. Amen. He's not talking about his church. He didn't say that the church is going to be poor. He never said that, right? I'm, and I'm not saying that you have to be rich or be greedy, or I'm not saying that. I'm saying that we, we, we got to get out of a place of worry, right? And, and get into a place of faith. We got to get into a place of, of because it's governmental. It's, it's, you know, we don't go to, just like people complain about the senators and the representatives. How many, how many senators do you know um, that's homeless? There's no such thing. It's, it's, it's no such thing, right? How many presidents do you know that are still struggling after they left the White House? There's no such thing. It's just, it's just, it just goes against everything that we know about government. Right? We don't, I mean, what kind of government? If, so if we expect that of our government, right? Wouldn't we expect more of the church? It's a governmental body. This is how we function in a place of authority. We function in a place of power. Amen. And it was, so, so we should understand that, okay, God has apostles. Uh, he has elders. He has deacons. Amen. Deacons also come to assist. So that this is why Paul said so that they can give more time for prayer, so they can give more time for uh, ministering the word of God. Amen. Uh, Pastor Teresa is not a deacon. Amen. I came in here the other day and I did the glass. It looks pretty good, right? And I vacuum, right? And so, I mean, we all learn these things through this is how you grow and this is how you become uh, uh, in positions of power and authority. And from the church's perspective, you learn how to serve. So it's all for, it's, it all starts from servanthood. I've been saved uh, I don't know, 30 years, I think, right? Or something like that, like 30, yeah. Uh, and so, you know, starting out in ministry, I was at the church when I gave my life to the Lord as a uh, young adult. Uh, you know, we uh, served, right? Uh, served uh, as a deacon, so to speak, because they called them trustees and uh, trustees or stewards, right? Served as a trustee for many years served as you know um, leader in the church in the capacity but there was always an aspect of doing something ar around the church to help with doing something around the church or helping um, and helps ministry in some kind of way right um, I went to another ministry so that was like seven years it's been four years at another ministry in service um, served as an usher armor bearer uh, so, so that's a good 11 years of the first years of, of being saved, just serving. Um, and then started out in, I mean, I did preach some preaching, um, but then when we start ministry on our own, I mean, I'm still, the, uh, Kahari learned how to do that stuff for me, right? Some of it, I mean, he, once he got older and really started learning how to do, he got, he, you know, surpassed me and doing these things, but I, I taught them how to do a lot of the soundboard stuff, keyboard stuff. I had to figure that stuff out for myself. The camera stuff, um, all that stuff. I did all that stuff, right? Sound, I, uh, I did all the stuff. The music, picked the songs, did the sound, uh, preach, did the video stuff, did all that stuff myself. So it, it never goes away. You're always a servant, but what happens is, as we begin to grow in ministry, what we learn to do is you know, once you master one thing, and so, you know, you, you work as a deacon and you master that area, then you learn how to serve and then you learn how to serve as an elder and then you learn how to serve, you know, at, at whatever capacity that the Lord has gifted you. And then that's when you move into fivefold ministry. But I believe everybody starts out as just a uh, helps ministry, um, deacon, uh, and then some form of eldership. And then when you get to the eldership level, then that's when you move into your gifts, your fivefold ministry gift, whether it be prophet, uh, pastor, evangelist, uh, teacher, because this, this is the office. It says these are the office of apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. What does that mean? That means you're in your official capacity. That means that now you have matured and now you're operating in your official capacity. I mean, I know I've given you all a lot about church structure, 
But uh, this is important. This is important for us to, if we really want to be effective and impactful as the church of Jesus Christ, we have to understand these things. And we have to move past just, um, I'm just here so somebody can pray for me, right? I'm just here so, uh, because I have nothing else to do. I'm just here, you know, because the pastor asked me to come and I want to show my support, you know. We got to move past that, right? We got, we got to come to a place of, God, where do I fit? God, what, you, know, uh, you know, because when it's all said and done, when you go before the Lord, he's going to ask you that question. Where did you fit? What did you do to mature? What did you do to fit into my ecclesia? Amen. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Lord God, we just thank you. God, I thank you, God, that you love us, that you care about us. God, that you have purpose for us. God, that you want to use us in a great way. And God, so I just, I I pray, God, that more revelation, God, be uh, released. God, that understanding will come. God, that, um, God, that you will help us to be able to hear what you are saying to us. That you'll help us to be able to see what you're showing us. And I pray for each and every person that's here, God. God, as as we struggle with where we fit, as we struggle with how we fit, God, as we struggle with what it is that you have for us next, God, I pray, God, that you make it clear to us. God, help us to see. Help us to know. Help us to be confident. Help us to know without a shadow of a doubt what our next step step is. And we just receive that grace and that favor. In Jesus' name, amen.